Good morning, eighth grade, and welcome to your third and final unit, Cardboard Relief. In this project, we're going to be using recycled materials to create a low-level relief uh, design for an intro to three-dimensional art. All right, so here you can see an image of an elephant that's rising up off the surface. Looks like he's walking through some kind of river with uh, trees and bushes. You can see the different layers and how the elephant is slowly rising off the paper. And to the right, you can see uh, the old image of Uncle Sam over top of a recycle symbol saying, I want you to recycle, which essentially is the focus of the lesson is using recycled materials to create art, specifically for us, a relief. So your lesson objectives are to explore and scrutinize examples of repurposed art by contemporary artists in our culture or of other cultures. We'll be looking at various artists through this slide. Utilize techniques of collecting pre-used materials that are ecologically responsible. I've done this objective for you. I've collected various cardboard from moving into the new house in Carlisle and um, from various orders and shipments to come to my house that is saved and collected it all for this assignment. And lastly, the main objective that you're responsible for is to manipulate pre-used cardboard to create a recycled cardboard relief. You will also be doing that in full color using oil pastels, um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit as we move forward. All right, let me move my screen here. All right, so we're starting off with recycled art. Recycled art is art that is created using discarded materials that once had another purpose. Down at the bottom left, you can see the image of seven figures. Uh, it's by an artist named Michelle Reeder. It's called Seven Wasted Men. And the materials for this project were made from one month of household waste from a family. So assuming it was a family of seven, they created all this trash in one month. The idea is that they created enough trash to create seven more people, just to show the amount of trash that can be created in a short amount of time from just one American family or one family from any country, really. The one on the right, the artists are Tim Noble and Sue Webster. It's called Dirty Trash. And the materials here are the pile the materials, the pile of trash is made from the remains of everything the artist needed to survive for the six months it took them to complete the sculpture. So basically the artist just took everything that they used uh, and made the sculpture out of it so as not to use any excess materials. And the neat thing about this is it's, at first it just looks like a big pile of trash. When you cast light on it, you can see two figures uh, basically in the background leaning against each other, which is a pretty neat image very clever take on recycled art. And then your question here is how does recycled art support environmentalism? Environmentalism is the conservation of the earth, the world that we live in. So here you have an image of, uh, why can I think of this? The girl with the pearl earring. <clears throat> the artist who made this is Jane Perkins. She's objects discovered at recycling centers and junkyards. So by using recycled art, you're conserving our environment by taking trash and making it, giving it a purpose so that it's no longer trash to help lighten the landfills and the pollution that's going on in our world. If we found more ways to use our recycled items beyond just art, it could make a huge difference, a huge impact in our world. Um, and the process uh, regarding Jane Perkins's art is that to create these masterpieces, Jane Perkins starts out with a large photo of the person or artwork she will be depicting, and then she starts attaching appropriately colored objects to the image. All right, so moving on. Sculpture. We all know what a sculpture is, but the formal definition is the art of making a three-dimensional representation of a form from materials. And a form is a three-dimensional object, uh, so the materials that made these or the artist Yang Ho Ji used uh, recycled tires to create both these sculptures. The one on the left is called Tire Lion. So instead of you know stacking up the tires and having a tire fire or just throwing them into the into our landfills, he made beautiful artworks, which are incredibly inspiring and incredibly detailed. So the question then is why does a sculpture in action immediately grab our attention? There's something to say about a sculpture that's resting still as compared to a sculpture in motion. Uh, so this art, artwork on the right is by an artist named Sayaka, if I'm pronouncing that right, Kajita Gantz. The materials are recycled plastic objects and to the left, I don't know the artist, but you have a bunch of old records that are flowing up like a wave. 
And the reason that sculptures and action grab our attention is because it draws us into it as if like we're moving with them. It almost gives us a sense of action, us a sense of purpose. Whereas something that's just stagnant and still uh, can quickly be looked at and uh, walked past. But having a sculpture in action really helps grab our attention and increase viewer engagement. Next vocab word is found object. A found object is an object an artist finds and keeps because of their interest in the object. Just like this artist, Leo Sewell, who made um, large dog off to the left. And you can see the two images in the middle with a bunch of different metal scrap parts. And then there's a bird to the right, a metal bird. Uh, so all the artists we've looked at thus far have basically used found objects and created recycled artworks from them. We'll be doing the same with cardboard. Next is the question, how can artists manipulate found objects to make various designs? So basically, one find, finding the recycled image or the materials is the first step, but then you have to think about how you're going to manipulate them, how you're going to create your, um, your sculpture. So basically, the found objects you have have different properties. Some are thin, some can be torn, some can be cut, some need to be welded or glued. So depending on the properties of your materials, you'll be able to do different things from them and make different designs based on their natural properties. So transformation refers to uh, changing the shape or appearance of something to create the final product. So off to the left, you have a sculpture of a horse trotting through the woods. Again, it's a sculpture of motion that uh, really sucks the viewer in. But it was originally made by just basic branches and twigs. And then through the various processes of uh, stripping the wood and snapping the wood and assembling it all together, created, transformed it into that horse. And same thing with the simple Coke can that many people see every day where the artists save them, cut them and assemble them to make this race car sculpture. So both the twigs and the Coke can were transformed to create the final image. And the question is, why is the transformation of found objects so engaging to the viewers? So we have looking at the artist Robert Bradford here, who in 2004, Bradford started using old toys to create sculptures. And as a parent myself, I can relate to all the toys that pile up around my home. Uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of his work, though, remains his close connections with psychotherapy and the study of the mind, particularly those created with trash toys. So we're talking about the transformation of objects being engaging, just like the toys that he finds. Uh, he's saying that, I guess, children or even adults have some kind of nostalgic connection to these toys where they're connected to different memories, uh, which you know, the toys themselves have a connection to, to an individual. So these found objects, we can all look at found objects and find some, some kind of connection as to, you know, oh, I drank it out of a Coke can before, or I played with that toy, or, you know, oh, I always have a lot of scrap cardboard lying around the house. So transforming these objects really just reminds us of how we use the same objects every day. And it's amazing how they can take what we consider trash into making a very engaging work of art. Next is relief. A relief is a sculpture with a raised surface. That's going to be the type of sculpture we are making for this unit. So this is a particularly important slide to demonstrate what a relief is. Here we have some uh, Roman soldiers off to the left made out of stone rising out from that stone background. But we, of course, are not using stone. We're using cardboard. And off to the right is different uh, layered cardboard uh, to create the relief of a dense forest and shrubs. So how can an artist use cardboard to create a relief? So as I just mentioned, I mentioned the word layers. You can measure, cut, and layer cardboard in, uh, you know, one on top of the other to create layers. And the image off to the left that says cardboard portrait design, it shows the artist brainstorm their sketch of how they would plan to layer the cardboard. You know, the light tan being the first layer, the light orange being the second, and then the yellow being the third layer. The marks are hard to see, but they are there. Uh, and then you can even see where it says example of layers, uh, the different textures. The artist is planning a whole bunch of things, really, really thinking this out before um, ahead of time. And you should do the same when you're planning your design, plan out the drawing, fill in where the layers will go with your pencil or color pencils. Uh, and then also think about the different textures, not the textures can add a different uh, level of engagement to your project. I really like this slide, so I hope you guys cycle back to this for a reference. 
Positive space is the intended space of the artwork. So the cardboard that you cut and layer is basically going to be your positive space. So in the uh, the bottom right image, it looks like to be a reference to a famous Vincent Van Gogh painting and his intended space, the positive space, is the bedroom itself, the, the bed, the, the walls, the floor. What's interesting about the image to the left of the two cats is that depending on your viewpoint, the black cat on the left could be the positive space and the white being the negative, but on the right, the white cat could be the negative space and the black background be the positive. So uh, depending on your viewpoint, you can see positive space in um, different areas of the work. Negative space is the opposite. Negative space is the space behind or around the positive space. So if in the middle, these two faces are the positive space and the black uh, space behind it is the negative space, um, then, sorry guys, I'm stumbling on what I'm saying, but basically the faces would be the positive space and the black would be the negative space. But this is actually also an illusion because if you look at the black as being the positive space, it almost looks like uh, some kind of vase or something, and the white's the negative space. So positive space and negative space has a lot to do with the perspective of the viewer sometimes, but usually you can identify what the positive space is, especially like a project like we're about to do. So your question for this slide is why would an artist want more positive space than negative space in their relief? The reason being the positive space is what draws the viewer in, not the negative space. Negative space leaves the artwork looking empty or incomplete. So the more positive space you have, the better. It'll show a higher level of planning and thoughtfulness in your, your artwork as opposed to having a whole lot of empty negative space. Texture is the surface quality of materials, how something feels, whether it's rough, it's smooth. Um, that, will, that will give it um, a level of engagement when you add it into your artwork, which leads me to the question, how can texture in a cardboard relief increase viewer engagement? So basically texture just adds a level of variety, uh, whereas instead of having a bunch of smooth flat layers, having different textures, different patterns and designs really adds a level of variety and contrast and makes the artwork more engaging. With cardboard specifically, uh, typically cardboard is corrugated. So actually if I take my mouse these lines right here, if you were to pull back the top layer of cardboard, you can show the corrugation, which will give it that, that rough texture, uh, which is in contrast to the smooth texture of the cardboard there. So that's something to think about as you design your, your relief. Think about the texture, whether you want to pull back that top layer and add some corrugation. And uh, you should be adding all of these into your brainstorming process uh, while planning and sketching out um, your design for your final project. So here's some lesson examples We're at the end of the slideshow here. These are just some other references. Um, some of these are incredibly complex and intricate. You unfortunately won't have enough supplies to make something like the image on the right of a Sunday on the Grand Jatte, um, that famous um, pointillism painting by George Surratt. But you know you could easily make something like this portrait of this woman here or this figure here. Here's Shrek and a turtle. Uh, these four images, you'll have enough cardboard to make something along that, that level of detail. Um, but these are perfect examples just to kind of help you get brainstorming if some of the other, some of the other images haven't already done that. Lastly, this is a very important slide because this can explain the steps of your project. I only have about a minute left. So how to complete your final project. Step one, you're going to sketch out your cardboard relief design. You're going to be given four pieces of pre-cut cardboard, the 9 by 12 inches in uh, dimension. Please make sure you sketch it out just like that one earlier slide. That's a, a perfect way to brainstorm a, a project like this where you're, you're drawing the details, but then you're also uh, shaping out the different layers and how you're going to create that um, fill that space. Step two, select one sheet of cardboard to be your base. So of those four, one will be completely untouched and the other three will be the ones you manipulate. Step three, you will draw, measure, and cut various layers of cardboard using those three extra pieces. And step four, you're gonna glue the layers of cardboard using the Elmer's glue that was given to you in your bag of materials earlier in the, um, in the year in your rotation to uh, your art class. Lastly, step five, use your oil pastels to apply color throughout your design. I know a lot of the images didn't have color in them. Uh, a good reference would be the elephant image in the first slide of the PowerPoint, but please add color throughout. Please message me if you have any questions. 
and I'll see you all in class.